Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, since he's left Amity, it's just amazing what he's done. He went out to Berkeley. That's great. Right? And then he created a career for himself. Uh, he founded a group, the Step Kids, which uh, uh, he, he toured. He's actually played here in the Out of Space. It's a CD he cut. Um, and since then, he has toured the world pretty much. Um, he's played with almost everyone. And Stevie uh, Wonder, I think, went to Africa, right? Uh, no, the Stevie Wonder was a TV performance we was did. TV? Who toured Africa? Alicia Keys. Alicia Keys. He toured the world with Alicia Keys, played the Super Bowl. That's correct. Right? And has uh, worked independently on his own. Um, he's very interested in sort of pursuing this about doing master classes and talking about guitars. Some of us have worked with him. He's in Mr. Hickerson's class. Um, and uh, we're just really happy that he's come back uh, to talk to us and work with us. Uh, he is an amazing guitar player. Absolutely amazing which is why people like Alicia Keys uh, want to work with him and pull him up and say, yes, this is a guy. And I think, weren't you the only lead guitar on that tour? That's the correct. only lead guitar player. And they played arenas, if I'm not mistaken. Did yeah, you? we did stadiums, arenas. Yeah, stadiums and arenas. So uh, let's just welcome uh, Jeff Gittleman back to Amity, folks. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. First. Um, thank you, guys. Yeah, what uh, Mr. First said is uh, true. I barely graduated. No, I'm joking. Um, yeah, no, I've been uh, playing guitar pretty much my whole life, and I've been since I graduated. And uh, since I graduated college, I've been doing playing guitar professionally, or just making music professionally. And um, yeah, I wanted to talk to you guys about what it is to be a professional musician and survive off making music, you know, and uh, actually by a show of hands, uh, by raising your hand, can you show me uh, who in here is interested in possibly after high school studying music in college or maybe uh, pursuing music professionally? Okay, that's good, that's good, that's good. Um, and uh, by a show of hands, uh, how many of you that raised your hands are um, interested in the performance element of uh, like in other words, playing instruments, and then I'm assuming the rest of you guys are interested in other aspects of the business, like production, composition, business, administrative stuff. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah. There's honestly, I could keep, I could talk for, for hours about about music. Um, we're gonna open it up to some questions if you guys have anything you want to ask. But yeah, just just to basically recap what Mr. First said. I've I've played with Alicia Keys, uh, Stevie Wonder, David Bowie, Coldplay, um, U2. Uh, yeah, I've, I've written songs with, uh, let me see, I just got my first platinum record with the J. Cole album. Uh, I've written some songs with it. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's been, you know, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a crazy ride. I feel like, although I'm older than you guys, I feel like in a lot of ways I'm still a student and I'm still getting started. And uh, yeah, I just kind of wanted to talk about different uh, aspects, the, the ups and the downs, and uh, you know, the, basically the general climate of, uh, of the music industry and what it, what it means to be uh, a part of it. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, I think a big thing I really wanted to talk about today is uh, individuality. Because um, I was actually really, really pleased to hear that uh, the school um, offers uh, production classes. And uh, we, me and Mr. Dolan were just talking about it. Um, is there anybody in here that's uh, taking these? What, what's the name of the course? Studio recording. Studio recording. Is there anybody in here in the class of studio recording? I got, we got one, two. OK, it's a tough crowd. OK, three, yes, all right. Um, yeah, because uh, I, I was, like uh, we were talking earlier, and I was actually, uh, yeah, very, uh, very happy to find out that the school offers that because when I was your age, um, we didn't have that available. In other words, to make a song, you have to have enough money to rent out a million dollar studio, and then on top of that, you need to have an engineer to help you run that million dollar studio. Um, these days, all you need is one of these. And uh, I feel like if I ask you to raise your hand, there's going to be a good amount of people here that have a laptop, Mac laptop available. 
Okay, 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 good, good. Um, but I'm assuming that these are available here at the school and you guys are able to use them whenever. So that's the big difference between our generations is that um, you guys have this stuff accessible to you at all times now. Um, and literally that is exactly what Grammy award winning producers and some of the world's biggest uh, music business modules use the same piece of equipment as you guys have available to you. So um, I wanted to talk about individuality because in, the, in this uh, generation and day and age, we have so much accessibility available to us. And uh, like I said, everybody has this machine available to them. So what ends up happening is that um, we end up all using the same machine and we end up using the same software and we end up using the same samples and we end up using the same synthesizers. And in my opinion, a lot of us end up sounding the same because we have the same resources available to us. So I feel like it's really important these days to be able to uh, identify your individuality and your unique voice. Um, for example, back in the day you could have you could have a drum set set up with the same exact microphones in the same exact studio in the same room with the same engineer and it'll sound one it'll sound a certain way one day. Then you could come back the next day and the drum set with the same mics, the same engineer, the same studio, the same drum set will somehow sound a little different. Maybe it was cold in the room and the drums got retuned a little bit or maybe the microphone moved half of an inch that way and all of a sudden the whole sound is different. So you almost had no choice but to, to have a unique sound because it was by default because from day to day even if you use the same equipment it's going to sound different. So let alone if you use different microphones, if you use different studio, if you use a different drummer, if you use a different drum set, that's obviously going to give you a different result. But these days we don't have that. These days when I pull up the Instrument 101 it's going to sound like Instrument 101 when you pull it up and it's going to sound the same way when I pull it up tomorrow. So, so in that case we end up what I believe that's why there's a lot of music out there that almost sounds very similar these days because that's the one thing that's lost is individuality. Um, how do you maintain your individuality in a world where everybody has the same resources available to them? Well, that's a, that's a tougher question to answer, but um, I believe that uh, to be a good leader, you have to be a good follower. And to, there's individu individuality is a two-step process. Um, first, you have to be a good imitator. You have to be able to study. In other words, I can't be eloquent in the English language if I don't know how to speak English. I'm not going to be able to substitute adjectives and use big words if I don't even know how to make a simple sentence. So my first step is to imitate, a baby's first step is to imitate somebody talking and they can say simple words. And then once you're able to imitate your mom and dad, then you're able to say other things, you know, and, and almost compose your own step. I feel like a lot of people these days almost forget about that other step and they learn how to imitate somebody and then they never, um, they never take that step further and almost, you know, invent something for themselves. So that is something I just wanted to touch base on. Um, but uh, you guys, you know, you guys are listening very carefully. I'm just wondering, is there anything that you guys would like to t me to talk about? Like I mentioned before, there's, I could go on and on and on and on about different things, but um, would you guys like to hear more about production and, and composition or would you like to hear more about performing? Do you want to hear some stories about celebrities? Do you want to hear, do you want me to play guitar? Do you want me to demonstrate anything? Yes. Yeah, how'd you get your first gig? I got my first gig. I graduated college, right? And this is, I'm glad you asked this story. So when I was in college, I went to Berkeley School of Music and we had about 1,500 students. They were all amazing, right? They were all, we were all, I was competing with, uh, there was 1,200, no, there was 900, no, I'm sorry, there was 1,200 guitar players alone in Berkeley School of Music. I was one of 1,200 guitar players. So you saw from the freshman year till the graduate, you saw who was the all-star player. Like you saw, and you know, I was, I worked really hard to be noticed. And I worked really hard to be, to excel. But I was never, I was, unfortunately, I don't know what it was. I believe that I was good enough to be, but for some reason I was never the guy that was the most popular, the most all-star player that people would always hire for, for recitals. So I, you know, I kept working and, and it was funny because you always saw people like, people dropped out and became famous and started doing this. 
and this person dropped out, went on tour. So you, you saw these people that you, that you knew, oh, that guy's gonna be successful, that guy's gonna be successful. But one of the most important things I learned is the value of networking, and that's just be able to meet somebody that you've never be, met before and be able to communicate with them and be able to ask them something, you know? And that was a very valuable lesson. So what happened is I kept in touch with some students just on a friendly basis. They, they, there was a couple of students, they were, they were brothers, um, and they never struck me as the people that were gonna leave school and be the most successful people. But I, I stayed friends with them, not for that reason. I mean, there was people that were like, okay, I wanna, I, wanna be, I wanna be friendly with them because I know they're gonna be successful and they're gonna need to hire somebody one day. But then there was people that you just kept in touch with just because they were your friends and they were your, they were your brothers, essentially, in this, in this maze of, of, of 1,200 other guitar players. Um, so I kept in touch with them and I, I moved back home with my parents um, and I was rehearsing and I got a phone call when I was uh, rehearsing one day with another band and it was one of these brothers and because they weren't the people that I thought were like, oh, these are the most successful, going to be the most successful people, I was like, ah, I'll send him the voicemail, he'll leave a message, I'll, uh, I'll get back to him. So rehearsing, we have a quick break from rehearsal and I check my voicemail and he says, hey Jeff, um, yeah, Lauren Hill is holding, do you, first of all, do you guys know who Lauren Hill is or am I dating myself? Nobody knows who Lauren Hill is? Oh gosh, Whew, tough crowd, tough crowd. Well, just to give you an update, uh, Lauren Hill I think still holds the record for the amount of Grammys won on a single album. I think her debut album from, she was in this group Fuji's, but when she released her debut album, she, I think she got like eight Grammys or nine Grammys that year or something, something crazy, more than Adele, let's just put it this way. You guys know who Adele is, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, so at that, at that point she was, you know, this is going 10 years ago, she was Adele. She was bigger than Adele. So anyway, I got, I got a phone call saying, hey, Jeff, this is very urgent. You gotta call me back right away. Lauren Hill is holding auditions just today. It was already like 2 p.m. at that point. She's holding auditions today at a studio in Boston. You have to come down right now. And that's it, that was the message. I was like, wow, okay, this is my chance, this is my opportunity. So I was in rehearsal, I said, guys, I have to leave this rehearsal, I, I can't be here, I have to, I have to go. They're like, why? It's like, Lauren Hill is holding auditions, I have to go, I have to go do this. You're like, yeah, go ahead, go. So literally, I already had my guitar, I already had my uh, pedal board, my amp. I, maybe I went home, grabbed some change of clothes, and I drove to Boston without even grabbing lunch, just, just went straight to Boston. I got there, um, there was about, 30 people, 30 other guitar players that day auditioning. And uh, yeah, I auditioned and I passed that day. I beat out the other guys. And then they said, oh, cool, we like you. We'll be in touch. I was like, great. I went home. I was like, yeah, I think I got the gig with uh, Lauren Hill. They're like, oh, great. And then I didn't hear back from them for two weeks. So I was like, whoa, what just happened? Then randomly I get a call from Lauren's manager and they asked me to come back for because they had more auditions. So I get there and I'm like, oh, okay, maybe there'll be like one or two other guitar players. Okay. So then I get there, and there's 10 guitar players that day. After I pass that day, they're like, all right, come back the next day. Come back the next day, there's 20 other guitar players the next day. I'm like, whoa, this is getting tough. I, they asked me to come back the next day. The next day, there's 20 more guitar players, and that were lasted. They, were they giving you music to play? Or were you just yeah, playing? it was literally, we were playing Lauren's big songs. So, and they have, this lasted for two weeks. She was there listening. This lasted for two weeks. I went there with my friends. Half of my friends, they were like, go home, don't come back. Me, they were like, come back tomorrow. So every day for two weeks, they had me come back. And every day I would come in, there would be new guitar players. They'd be like, hey, they would be so excited to be there. And by the end of the day, they'd shrug their shoulders and, and be asked to leave. Um, and after two weeks, and what seemed like maybe 200 guitar players, I, uh, I was chosen to uh, be her guitar player. And uh, we did a European tour. And uh, that's how I got my first gig. So you know they say I'm glad you answer, you asked that because there's two actually points in that that I'd like to um, bring up. One which I already have is the networking part. Like, you know, you know how it is. Sometimes you just want to be friends with the popular guy or girl, you know. But you never know. You never know the underdog. You might you, the the person that you look over and you think the quiet one. You think that they're not going to do anything. You're like you'll be surprised as as you grow. You'll see, and that's not not just in the music industry. That's in everything. You know, you, you look at the obvious, but to me, that's simple. Anybody could look at the obvious and say, oh, this guy's gonna be the best. But to me, the talent is seeing something in somebody that 
not everybody else sees. Sometimes even the person themselves don't see it. And that to me is some of the most successful people out there is that they're able to see something in a, in a, in a kid or a person and they're able to invest in them before anybody else invests. Because it's easy to invest in somebody when you already know. Like it's easy to invest in IBM now or, or Mac, and Mac now in a stock now because everybody knows that's successful. But are you smart enough to have invested in IBM before IBM was IBM? That's the real genius to me, you know? So um, that's the one point I'd like to bring out is networking is very important. Shaking hands, getting to know people. Even if you don't think they're gonna be the next star, it's very important to keep in touch with people. Not just, not just because you want something from them, but by communicating with people, you're actually becoming really good at a certain skill. And to me, music is just like the film industry. It's a collaborative medium. You could be great at what you do, but if you can't get along with people, you're not gonna get hired. Like if I'm a pain in the butt to work with and I'm always getting mad at people and you can't even talk to me, nobody's gonna wanna hire me. Cause to be honest with you, when you get hired, you get hired half for your skill, but the other half you get hired is how you interact with people, you know? Um, you know, Mr. Hickerson, he could, be, he could be the best, you know, he could be the best vocal instructor in the world, but if he's, if he's not, if you're not able to get along with him and, and he's just always yelling at everybody and you know, not that he ever yells at anybody. Um, it's, I'm, what I'm saying is your, your attitude and your personality and how you're able to get along with people, how, how your ability to be a team player is what makes you uh, work, is what gives you employment. Just like with sports and basketball, you can be a great shooter, but if you're not able to pass the ball and if you're not able to play defense, do the other words, nobody's going to hire you. Nobody's going to, um, yeah, nobody's going to, make you a part of their team. So that's the one point, Net networking is important. But another point I want to bring up is that um, in that case is they say that uh, um, success is preparation meets opportunity. And that's what it was, you know. I, I've been practicing guitar countless hours a day since I was, you know, 12 years old. And, you know, when I got the call to play with Lauren, I was 23 years old. So there was 11 years of me practicing full time, doing countless hours of, 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 of shows, field work, countless hours of practicing, countless hours of networking, just, you know, it becomes a lifestyle. You don't even count the hours after a while because it's just what you do. You wake up, you practice, you wake up, you, 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 you do what you want to do, you know, what you're, what you're meant to do, what you believe you're meant to do. So I spent 11 years preparing and then the opportunity came and I demonstrated, and that's, that's what allowed that um, situation to become successful. Some people, some people spend their whole life preparing and they never get the opportunity. I believe opportunity is not, it's not just luck. It's not just, oh, you happen to be at the right place at the right time. I think opportunity, if you work hard enough, it's inevitable that it's gonna be a matter of time until you're gonna be presented with the opportunity, but are you gonna be prepared? Because there's, I know, especially living in a town like Los Angeles, um, that I'm living in now, there's a lot of people getting a lot of opportunities, but they're not necessarily prepared. They didn't necessarily spend 11 years uh, preparing for that moment, you know? They, they could walk into a bar and somebody could see them and say, oh, great, like you look like you could be in my next movie. And, you know, and they think they, they, they're able to get this opportunity, but in reality, even if they get that role or that opportunity, it's not gonna be a long, it's not gonna be a longevity, it's not gonna be a long term successful situation because at the end of the day they don't they might not even deserve it they're not prepared for it so there's a, those are the two aspects of it I, I definitely want to um, recap on that that you know people say oh well you're lucky you were in the right place at the right time it's like well if you consider going to school for four years and practicing uh, you know eight hours a day for 11 years and then living with your parents um, for years after school unemployed if you consider that uh, luck and all right, you know, that, I, didn't, cause I don't consider that luck. So, like I said, it was just a matter of time until I got that opportunity. And to be honest with you, when that opportunity fell through after we were touring and, you know, she, she, wasn't, she wasn't able to, to pay, what, you know, the, her company, which before, and we all kind of, she stopped touring for a reason. And she, uh, when that happened, the other guys, they went back to doing what they were doing. You know, me personally, I knew that it was going to be a matter of time until I was going to get another opportunity. And it was, it was about four months till I got the other opportunity. And my next opportunity, I was playing with this guy, Bobby Brown. 
And that lasted for a couple months. And when that, when that stopped, I knew it was going to be a matter of time until I got my next opportunity because I knew that I was prepared and I was willing to do what it takes to get the opportunity. I was willing to go to New York, meet people, network with people because I've already w learned these networking skills from, from going to college. So then it was a matter of time. It was four months after the Bobby Brown um, job I had that I got the opportunity. I got a call one day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it was just a, then a matter of time till the next opportunity, which really was life changing for me, um, uh, playing with Alicia Keys. That's when I got called. Um, and it, I knew it was inevitable because at that point I was just waiting for the next opportunity because I knew I had the preparation for it and I wasn't worried. Uh, so then, yeah, I got the call one day and uh, said, Alicia Keys is looking for a new guitar player, and that changed my life. And um, yeah, it's been a crazy, it's been a crazy ride. Um, is there any other questions that you guys have before I move on from, uh, uh, sorry. Which artists have influenced you the most as a musician? I'm sorry, say it again? Uh, what artists or bands have influenced you the most as a musician? Oh, influenced me? Well, I really fell in love with music because uh, of the Beatles. When I was a kid, that was my first big influence, the Beatles. I also, I was exposed to uh, Stevie Wonder at a very young age, too. Um, so the Beatles and Stevie Wonder were really my two biggest influences as a kid growing up. Then, you know, like any kid who uh, started to uh, eh, have a little contempt for their parents, I got into heavy metal. I got into uh, hip hop music. Uh, huge fan of hip hop, you know, um, when I was a kid. Um, culturally, it had a big impact on me. Um, and then, you know, after that, when I really started getting proficient on my instrument, I, I really got into uh, jazz and classical music. Um, so you see, I, I, come, I come from a, from a different generation. I come from a generation now, and I don't find anything wrong with it. Now I find that uh, kids get started on music through laptops. And that's what a producer does is, when you say you're a producer, you're, you're essentially a beat maker on, on a laptop. I come from a different generation where a producer was able to orchestrate. He was able to write out for a string quartet. He was able to write out for a choir. He was able to uh, uh, coach a rhythm section. And he was able to uh, coach a vocalist through a song. To me, that, that, the generation I came from, that's what a producer does, not just somebody who's able to make beats on a laptop, which I'm not, I'm not trying to say that it's not valuable, because it is very valuable. And I, and I do find a lot of value in it, because I myself also am a beat maker as well. And I believe that you have to keep up with the, with the times. And there's going to be a time 10 years from now that you, that you guys are going to find yourself, oh, what? There's a, new, there's a new machine out there, the new MacBook? Oh, all the kids are using it. Oh, I don't know. I like my old one. And there's going to be that time that you're going to have to make that adjustment and keep up with the younger generation. But yeah, as far as influences, what I found personally um, in, in recognizing my own individuality is that um, for example, if I was a cook, right? And if I was only able to make pizza, I mean, what are the odds of me actually having the best pie in the world, you know? But if I'm able to make pizza, but I'm, a I'm able to make steak, I'm able to make fish, I'm able to make this and that, maybe I can combine the pizza, the shrimp, and the steak into a new pie that nobody has ever done before, you know? I'm just using that as an example. I know that sounds really nasty, but I'm just, I'm just using that as an example. But to me, I find that, you know, you don't, you don't create really much on your own, you're almost taking influences. Like a, like, a, like a chef, he takes the same salt that the next person uses and the same pepper, but he's able to combine the ingredients in a way that nobody's ever combined. Just like all the words that I'm saying now have all been said a million times, but the combination of the, those same words that I'm assembling is what gives me my own voice, perhaps. You know. Somebody else had a question down there? <laughs> It's tough. It's tough to answer that because I can't. I can't ever, you know, give uh, give credit to one song. Or people ask me, "What's your favorite artist?" Or your favorite this. I, it's it's hard for me to. Uh, it's really hard for me to to give that credit to one entity because, you know, just just like every other human being in the world, you know, I have moods. Sometimes I wake up and I'm sad, or sometimes I wake up and I'm really excited. Other times I wake up and I'm tired, you know? So it depends on the mood of the day. Um, 
not every day I feel like playing a fast song. Sometimes I wake up and I really want to play something fast. Other times I, it's a rainy day and I have a different mood. So that's what makes us unique and that's what makes us human beings and not machines. Like this machine, when I press the space bar, it's always going to do the same thing. It's always, well not right now, but it's always going to do the same thing. It's always going to do exactly what you tell it to do the space bar. Us human beings, I could play the same note on the same instrument and it will never sound the same. It will never be the same thing. And that, that's, that's what I really admire about the generation that I came from is that um, human element that can never be replaced and that, that gives you your own individuality, you know? What year did you graduate? High school? Yeah. 2000. How do I balance influence versus uh, individuality? That's a great, that's a great question. I guess it touches on what I was saying before: is that you know you have to you have to first imitate. You have to be able to get influenced by somebody. You have to study somebody, and then you almost have to say forget you to them. You know, it's like it's like I guess it's like it's like growing up. You know, first you you, you have your parents. They're there to give you your foundation. You know, but then there comes a point when you're 18 and you say, Mom and Dad, thank you so much for everything. I have to go now and it's time for me to go away and grow up, you know, and, and I'm going to come back a different person. You have to expect that. So same thing, you know, I grew up on the Beatles and I grew up on Stevie Wonder, but then there came a time where I said, you know what, I'm going to put that down and I'm going to listen to more obscure things like Sun Ra or like Ornette Coleman or uh, like Donny Hathaway. Does it, everybody knows who Stevie Wonder is, right? But does anybody know who Donny Hathaway is? Does anybody know who uh, Curtis Mayfield is? Otis Redding, Sam Cooke, all those guys. It, it's, it's important to, it's always important to, um, it's always important to dig deeper, you know, and, and at a certain point, just like going away to college, you say thank you to your influences, but say, I'm going to have to put you down for, for a minute, you know. What else? Do you enjoy playing bigger like, arenas, but playing different people's, like at least keys music? Do you like playing smaller shows, playing stuff? That is awesome question. That is awesome question. Even with Alicia, sometimes playing a big stadium, like you don't even see what's going on. All I see is these people in the front row and everybody else, the, the 50,000 people, they're all a blur in the, in the shadow to me. I don't even know. All I see is the, the people smiling in the front row. So it's like you almost, although it's amazing to play the Super Bowl and to be watched by 8 million people, you feel removed. Sorry, I had to, had to drop that. <laughs> No, no, just million, just million. Um, it's amazing that you do feel a little removed and that you're not able to make that connection. Having said that, we, we did shows with Alicia in front, of, in front of 200 people. You know, we did shows in front of 8 million people and we did shows in front of 200 people. And sometimes the, the 200 people feels really, really, really good. It feels much better because you, you see everybody in the room and, and the energy that you get back from these people is, is so tangible as opposed to playing a big arena where you don't, you don't get that same tangible uh, feeling back, you know? So yeah, it's tough, and, and, the, and the same thing goes with the Step Kids. Like sometimes, you know, you play with the Step Kids, and it's, I play with my own band, and it, it's, it's the greatest feeling in the world because it's, uh, you might be playing for 50 people, but it's those 50 people that you can see that you're changing their lives. Like you can see in their eyes that you're literally changing their culture. You go to a small town like Cleveland, Ohio, or whatever, some small town, Columbus, Ohio, where, they, where you're doing something that they've possibly never seen before, you know, and you're, you're doing a certain element of your performance that they have never seen on TV or in, in person do before. So sometimes that could be very gratifying, you know. Other times, it could be very lucrative to play in front of 8 million people. <laughs> that could be very enjoyable as well. Um, Yes. Anybody? Anybody else? Okay. Did you ever meet well, yeah. Chris is Chris Peanut Butter Wolf Manic is one of my really good friends. Um, so I'm assuming you know that I'm signed to his label. Yeah. So we've we've done we've done tours. Um, yeah. We've I've done tours. I've he I lived with him on the bus for 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 months. He's uh, he's my uh, partner. He's my legal partner in the, in my band. So yes, I do know Chris very well. Yes. Uh, favorite guitarist, like current guitarist, that you like to listen to that you're influenced by now, or maybe. There's just so there's just so many people 
there's a young kid who's, I think, 25 years old by the name of Isaiah Sharkey out there that I find to be extremely exciting. He's uh, D'Angelo's guitar player. And uh, I mean, you can see some video clips of this kid on the internet that would just scare you, you know? And I remember seeing him play when he was 20 years old and he was just as amazing, you know? So then there's, there's definitely, um, there's definitely people come along that I get really influenced by. This band, Snarky Puppy, if you guys ever check them out, they have three guitar players who are all phenomenal. And it's just, uh, it's very exciting to watch. I mean, there's honestly, I, the, the truth is I'm really influenced by every, every guitar player I see. Even if I hear a guitar player that I don't like and I'm like, oh my God, They're like, oh, why do I have to listen to this? To be honest with you, what I really learned over the years is that even if you, even if you meet somebody you don't like, or if you hear somebody that you don't like, it's very important for you to listen closely to what they're doing because you, if you meet somebody, and let's say if you're talking a lot, I'm like, oh, I don't like this guy, he talks so much. But then I'm like, wait a second, do I do that? Oh, no, I do do that. So now I've, I'm able to get uh, perspective. And through seeing a quality of your personality that I don't like, I'm able to see, oh, man, maybe I do that to people. Maybe I need to stop. So now I have perspective. Same thing with guitar playing. I see a guitar player, let's say I don't like the way he bends notes or I don't like his tone, and I hate maybe listening to it. And I'm, then I start thinking, I'm like, wow, but don't I do that sometimes? Or do I do that? Or if the answer is no, I don't, all right, great, I don't do it. But sometimes, more often than not, I'm like, do I do that? I'm like, I do do that. OK, maybe I should stop, because I used to think it sounds good. But now that I actually see somebody doing it, it's actually not that cool at all. So even when I'm, I'm trying to take influence from everybody, people I like and even people I don't like, I question why I don't like them and move forward in trying to avoid those elements in my playing. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Abs yes, please. Please. I'm a little rusty, but I think I could uh, warm up a little bit. Oh, no, it's good. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, I do, I do, I do. Oh, yeah, perfect. Do you have any guitar players? Do you have any? <laughs> Show of hands, any guitar players in the house? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, cool. Yeah, this doesn't even pertain necessarily to guitar, but um, let me see. When I, when I grew up, I was really influenced by, uh, like I said, as a cook who, who takes different styles from different, you know, you can be influenced by Asian cuisine and then influenced by Italian cuisine and combine it into the same world. You know, I, I really liked, let's say, blues, you know? Right, that kind of stuff. Um, then I also like jazz. So I really like that kind of stuff too, but the, the, the players that I was really influenced by, they really did only one or the other. You had the BB Kings of the world, you know, who did the that stuff, and then you had the Joe Pasta. The music that basically our grandparents listened to, right? So I always, you know, I always refused. I studied and imitated both of those guys um, vigorously, but what I really was interested in is to be able to have my own voice and uh, you know I'll play a song and maybe you guys could just see how you know how I tried to combine both of those styles let's say the BB King style and the Joe Pass style you know so
also have to excuse me, I'm a little, uh, it's a little too early to be getting so fancy. Um, but yeah, so just, that's just, you know, it's basically different elements, like I was saying, different elements of different styles that I combine into my own unique voice, you know, and I, I could sit there and I could imitate B.B. King, you know, but the reality of it is I'm never going to be as good at being B.B. King as B.B. King is as good as being B.B. King. But I'll tell you what, there's going to be nobody in the world that's going to be better at being Jeff Gittleman than Jeff Gittleman. So you almost don't have a choice to be an individual, so you might as well embrace it, you know. If you believe that, oh, you're not as good, you're not as good as this next person, oh, they're so much better than me, oh, God, they're, oh, I'll never be as good as them. And, you know, if you're feeling that way, you're probably right, but you know what? They're never going to be as good at what you do than what you do. I mean, they're never going to be as good at being you as you are. So take influence from them and take, you know, use that as inspiration and motivation to get better. But at the end of the day, always keep in mind that there's always something that you're going to be able to, there's always going to be a voice that you're going to be able to have that they're not going to be able to have. Because you are, you're the only person, you're the only you. You're going to be the best you at all times. So that's, yeah, that's that. Um, any, any questions? Yes. I noticed a lot about, about, from Jonathan, you guys have been following you online and stuff, and you've been playing a lot with hip hop artists. Yes. And that's unusual to have you, as far as I think, are hip hop. So how have you found that voice that's been coming? Yeah. Chance to rap or some other yeah. Like, Let me see. I mean, I've, I've worked with uh, uh, 50 Cent, um, Chance the Rapper, J. Cole, uh, Feral Monch. I mean, there's definitely some other names that I, I, uh, I just can't think of right now because it's too early. But uh, yeah, well, you know, that was, as, as I was touching on a little bit earlier, um, when I was growing up, um, hip hop was just starting to really become culturally dominant. Um, I, moved, I moved to this country, I, I'm from Russia originally, and I moved to this country in 1991. And, in 92 is when uh, Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre came out and it was it was a very you know it was a very epic time so you know culturally speaking you know there wasn't a lot of diversity um, there wasn't a lot of cultural diversity where I came from I came from Russia you know and uh, you know I moved to a suburban town like Orange Connecticut so there wasn't I wasn't able to get a lot of cultural diversity but through the music I was uh, I was able to satisfy that part of me that that wanted to learn about different cultures and learn, learn about different music and and be able to expose to different art and different artists. So I, I really gravitated towards hip hop because I love the I love the rebellion part of it. I love the rhythmical element of it. Um, you know, I, I loved I loved that in, 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 just like in country music where where images imagery is everything. I love that hip hop imagery is everything. It's totally different than the imagery you get in country music, but essentially it's the same thing. You know, you're it's a, it's not just music. You're it's a character that you're in, in emotionally investing in. You know, um, so when I went to college, is in 2000 was actually, like I mentioned Lauryn Hill, you have people like Lauryn Hill, the Fugees, the Roots, Jay-Z, and at that time, all those <laughs> artists were first starting to use uh, uh, live musicians. Um, the Roots being the, the forefathers of having live musicians in, in hip hop, what I believe. Um, so when I was in school, it was so academic and it was so about playing scales that I really gravitated to, to playing hip hop because it was, exact opposite of that. It was simple. Like with hip hop, that song, I don't know if you guys know the song All About the Benjamins. Uh, no? But literally the guitar line in All About the Benjamins is, is one note. Now you might ask, okay, Jeff, you went to college for four years, you've been playing guitar for tw 12 years, practicing eight hours a day. Why would you be interested in playing one note for the whole song, like what, what could possibly be so spiritually gratifying about playing one note, you know? But the answer to that is, is sometimes it's a lot harder to play one note, and sometimes it's a lot harder to get your message across saying one word as opposed to talking for an hour. 
you know? I wish there was a way that I could say everything I'm saying now with one word. I mean, that would make me the most, you know, efficient communicator of all time, you know? But that's the same thing with music. Sometimes it's, it's a lot harder to be consistent and perfect in playing one, word, one note and getting your point across as opposed to be playing gazillion notes and then having it fly over people's heads. So I gravitated towards hip hop when I was in college because um, it was everything that I wasn't getting in college. It was everything that, that the Academy of Berkeley wasn't providing for me and it was 100% feeling. As opposed to the jazz which was feeling but also involved academics and, and thinking, this involved nothing but feeling. So that's why I gravitate towards it naturally as a fan. And then when I left, I, a lot of people started looking you know, for musicians to employ for because a lot of rappers wanted to expand their sound and start using live musicians. So me personally, I was one of the first people that they started calling because I naturally had a love and affinity for hip hop music and an understanding for the feeling of hip hop and what it means. Because essentially when you play, when you play with, with a hip hop artist, what you're doing is you're essentially replicating a sample. And a sample is, is just done by a machine. So sometimes you'd be surprised how many amazing musicians have a hard time just doing one. You'd be surprised how hard it is to play one note sometimes. And people start doing that and they're like, and they're like, no, just one note. And then they just can't, they can't, they can't process that. So that's why, yeah, when, when a lot of artists, hip hop artists are looking for, for musicians, they, they need musicians that are able to be the, um, the bridge between their music and the music that they're trying to uh, uh, go after. So, um, you know, luckily enough, I'm, I'm trusted to be that bridge, you know, musically and culturally speaking. You talked about, you know, you got into hip hop because it was something that the school wasn't giving you. Yeah. That brings me back to when you were talking about networking, right? When you were at Berkeley, did they teach you about that or did you just come to that realization for your own good common sense? It, 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 you, it is thrown in your face. They don't teach you to network, but it's thrown in your face the moment you get there and you realize you don't know anybody. There's 1,200 other people walking around with guitar cases on their back, and you don't have anybody to play with. You don't, you don't have any other musicians you could share, and, the only, and everybody's in the same boat as you. They're there to become the next best Michael Jordan of music, you know? So, you know, me growing up in here, I, I, in, in Connecticut, I was already uh, uh, professionally active. I already had jobs. I already had shows. I was already playing at Toad's Place. I was already making money. And I already had a, a, a list of people, most of which were older than me, that I would call when I needed work, when I needed um, to accompany. But when I got to Berkeley, I didn't know anybody to play with. I didn't have, even if I had a show, which I didn't at that time, because nobody knew me enough to give me a job, I wouldn't even know who to hire. So it. Right away, I knew. Okay, I need to. I need to meet musicians. I need to. I need to establish a network. So that was from day one. I remember it was so overwhelming that I, you know, I realized that the only way I'm going to survive in, in amongst this is that if I get some allies, you know, if I gain some allies. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Go ahead. Could you shred? Oh, I'm sorry? Could you shred? Can I shred? Like, am I able to or, or am I willing to do it right now? <laughs> um, I'm not really a good shredder anymore, but especially early in the morning, but um, I could try to embarrass myself. Something like that, maybe, or yeah, yeah. just okay. <laughs> I really. It's, it's good. It's good to be able to to be able to do stuff like that. You know what I what I believe makes a, a professional. Like for example, if I'm if I'm a, 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 a repairman, right? It, and you you call me because you your sink is leaking. You know I'm gonna come with all my tools. 
but I'm not going to start fixing your light because just because I came, oh, you know what? Well, since I'm here, I already have tools to fix your light. But you're like, but my light is not broken. My sink is broken. I'm like, it's okay. I love fixing lights. And you're like, that's what I feel like a lot of musicians do. They come prepared with all their tools, and they're inappropriately using their tools when it's not required for the job. What I'm doing, what I just did there, I'm able to do. But I'll tell you, 99% of the time, I'm not required to do it. But I love having that as a tool, because the one time that I do show up and this person says, actually, yes, my light is actually also broken, then I'm like, yes, I have the tools. But I'm not just going to go to somebody's house and they want me to fix their bathtub and I'm going to start fixing their light. you know. So it's important to keep that in mind, to have these tools, but to not use them. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> It's great to see him, and he's uh, coming all the way from Los Angeles. Uh, he's riding a wave of success that he has worked really hard to earn. Um, and so he's going to talk to you a little bit about the work that he's done and uh, how it has paid off. Uh, some of the stuff that he's done, you certainly are aware of. Uh, he co-wrote the song Apparently with Jay Cole. Maybe you could talk about the collaboration process a little bit. Absolutely. How do you, go, how do you write a song with somebody? We I have to get my lawyer on the phone before I do that, but no, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and a, a number of other things. He's toured all over the world playing uh, with various musical artists, uh, some of whom were his idols. And uh, you know he's our idol. We love Jack. Thank you. Uh, so we're. Uh, I'm just gonna stop talking so you can hear from him uh, for as much time as we have. Today. Welcome, Jim. Welcome, Welcome Jim. Jim. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Malloy, Mr. First, and uh, thank you, guys. Um, yeah, basically, yeah. Mr. Malloy is not a liar. He, uh, this is true. This is true. I did. Uh, Co-write apparently, which we just uh, just went platinum, my first platinum record. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. And um, yeah, and I did I did tour the world. Some of the people that I have performed and shared the stage with are uh, Lauren Hill, Alicia Keys, Stevie Wonder, uh, Cheryl Crow, Coldplay, uh, U2. <sighs> There's a bunch I can't even think of right now. Honestly, it's just so many. Um, 50 Cent. It's just so. Yeah, so I, I've, I've, I've been in different, I've been fortunate enough to be on different sides of the uh, music industry. Um, ha mostly half of my work has been performing and uh, touring the world with different artists and uh, performing on stages all around the world. And the other half of my work has been uh, production and composition, which is uh, recording, writing songs, like apparently, and um, yeah, with, with projects like my own group, the Step Kids, I'm actually able to combine both of those elements. and. Uh, write, compose, produce the material, and then also tour and perform promoting the material. So, uh, you know, like I said, I've been very fortunate enough to see the different sides of the business. And uh, uh, by a show of hands, is uh, anybody here interested in pursuing music after high school, maybe in college or professionally? One, two, three, four. Okay, five. Okay, okay, okay. We've got a few people. Um, and I'm assuming uh, the rest of you guys are, are interested. Let me ask you, uh, just so we, uh, so I know what to dive into. Um, by show of hands, who's more interested in me talking about the performance side of, of the, the performance, the touring, the playing instruments uh, with artists and celebrities? Who's more interested in that than the, the writing and the composition side, by show of hands? OK. And how about who's more interested in, in the production, being in the studio, writing, composing? Uh, producing records. Okay, all right, about even. All right, I'll, I'll touch on both. Um, okay, let me see. I'll try to make this quick. I, I uh, I've been practicing guitar for multiple hours a day since I was uh, 12 years old. I uh, got a scholarship to go to Berklee School of Music, where I thought because I got a scholarship, I was going to be the hot new gun guitar player. Get there, and uh, when I arrive, I notice that there's 1,200 other guitar players just like me with carrying around their guitars in their back and that when I go to test out of my initial classes I actually don't get very high scores although I got a scholarship to go there for some reason I didn't 
test very high for some reason in, in these classes. So then I see 1,200 other guitar players that are literally in the same classes, in the same position as me. So I learned very quickly the, the, the values of networking and uh, meeting people and establishing uh, relationships with people. And I learned very quickly uh, the value of having discipline, disciplines and um, working really hard for what you have. And even though you believe that you're the best, you, you have to, your disciplines have to, uh, has to reflect that. So let me talk first about the networking part of it. Um, when I graduated college, my first job was um, playing guitar with Lauren Hill. Um, and although you guys might not know who she is uh, at that time, uh, in 2000, about 10 years ago, she was, she was one of the biggest artists in the world. She won some of the most Grammys for her debut album. Still up to date, I think she holds a record for some of the most Grammys won on a debut album. Um, so I, I, they say the success is um, opportunity meets preparation. Um, so I've been preparing for my whole life. I've been preparing, playing, practicing six to eight hours a day since I was a kid. I went to Berklee School of Music. I kept practicing hours and hours and hours a day. I, only to graduate, so I was practicing for 11 years from the age of 20, from the age of 12 to 23, and at the age of 23, I got a knock on my door, or rather a message on my, on my cell phone, to audition for Lauren Hill. I went and auditioned for Lauren Hill, and I was competing against 200, about 200 other guitar players, and I was given the job. And that's, that's what I mean by preparing for 11 years just for that opportunity to be able to audition for Lauren Hill. A lot of people now, you know, they say, oh, okay, but you, you were in the right place at the right time, you know. And actually, I don't necessarily that to be true because I, although I know a lot of people who've been preparing their whole life and never got that knock on the door and they never got that opportunity, I do believe that opportunity is something that you work for, you know. If you're living in Columbus, Ohio, and you're wondering why nobody has recruited you yet, you know, the answer is right there. You know, people get recruited in cities like Nashville, Los Angeles, Atlanta, New York City. So if you feel like you're not getting an opportunity, it's just like anything else. It's just like disciplines. If I feel like I'm not good enough at, at, at doing pull-ups, well, what's the only way to get better? Is to do more pull-ups. Same thing with opportunity. If you feel like you're not getting your opportunity, then uh, you need to go where the opportunity is, you know, whether that means, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of uh, uh, sacrifice that goes into it. That means you might have to relocate, you might have to uh, move to a different city, you might have to adjust your lifestyle a little bit, you know. This is something that um, I still, you know, we still deal with a lot. Um, but so, the, all right, so then that's that, that's preparation, and, oh, that's the opportunity. But also in a town like Los Angeles, I find that there's a lot of people who have the opportunity but they don't have the preparation. In other words, they have the opportunity because they're hanging out at the same clubs and the same bars and rubbing elbows with some of these big people, but they expect just because they have the opportunity, just because they're in the right place. In other words, just because you're in the right place at the right time does not mean you're going to succeed. You know, you have to be at the right place at the right time and you have to be prepared. You know, so um, like I said, I, I, was, I was fortunate enough because I spent my whole life preparing, and I still, I still prepare every single day. Um, I practice, I write music for, for the chance that when I do get the knock on the door and people say, okay, man, what you got? I'm, I'm not gonna be able to, I'm not gonna, you know, get scared and I'm gonna actually be able to sh showcase what, I, what I've been working hard for, you know? Um, so yeah, my first job was playing with Lauren Hill and, you know, when that uh, fizzled out, um, I got the next job playing with Bobby Brown. When that opportunity fizzled out, I got the next job playing with this guy, Jaheim, and when that fizzled out, or when should I say, when I quit that, um, I, got the, I got a call to play with Alicia Keys. So, you know, because I, I just think it's important to say this, that uh, if you work hard there's, and you believe in and invest in yourself, there's no, there's no telling where you could accomplish almost anything. You know, I have friends that had an opportunity that fell through, and then 10 years later, they're still saying, oh, if if that opportunity just, if the circumstances were just different, I'd be such in a different place now, you know? And I always have to call them out and say, that's not true because I've lost opportunities and look where I am now. And if I had the opportunity I have now, if I lose it, I promise you, tomorrow I will hunt down another opportunity. That one opportunity that I lost is not gonna ruin my life. And if, if, if it all fall apart, if it all falls apart today, 
I promise you that tomorrow I'm going to chase the other opportunity and I'm going to get it. And no one circumstance is ever going to be responsible for my failure or success. And um, that, that's, that's one of the important things uh, in the music industry, you know. Um, I feel like the, the, one of the biggest distinctions between us and normal corporate world is that, you know, uh, in the normal world, corporate world, people go to uh, work nine to five, you know, and I really admire and respect that, that uh, consistency. But in a music world, it's like fishing. If the tide is low or if the tide is high and you're, well, I'm not a fisherman, so I don't know, but I'm just using it as an example. <laughs> if you're, you know, if, 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 if it's rainy, if it's a certain circumstance, you might not get a fish that day. You might not eat. So that means that the day before, if you caught two fish, that means you have to save one. So that's, that's what's been, you know, the inconsistencies of the music industry is something that's very natural and it's something you have to embrace. So when you do have success, you can't just expect that you're going to, it's Monday and you have success, you can't just expect to go to work on Tuesday and do another 9 to 5. You might not have employment on Tuesday. So when you get your success on Monday, you have to put one fish away. And um, I feel like that's, it for those of you who are interested in, in pursuing um, music or any kind of ent entertainment industry, uh, position that is something very important to keep in mind the climate of you know the climate of of the industry and the inconsistencies and and what it takes to, to have stability in it you know um, I could keep talking and talking and talking forever uh, does anybody have any questions yes mr. Dolan um, yes Absolutely. Or an idea. You know, we always hear uh, some of these guys like, you know, you work with the edge, so you probably had a great opportunity to talk to them a little bit. But, you know, the, the early U2 stuff was a lot of built ideas uh, that came into songs and different, different things like that. And you can talk a little bit about that, your process and how that works. Absolutely. One second. One second. I'm just uh, setting up a track. So, uh, So while we're setting this up, I just uh, wanted to quickly talk about the importance of networking. Um, and it's basically, it's, 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 to me, it's 50%. Your relationships with people are literally 50%. Um, it's the opportunity that we speak of. You know, When I say preparation, that's the practice. That's your craft. Um, opportunity, that's your relationships. Is it playing? It should be. I, I'm getting signal coming out. I don't know why. Uh, Okay. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm getting no, signal. It's coming. It. it was working before. Can we plug into this? Yeah. Oh, I know why. That's my fault. My bad. Here. Yes, sir. Okay. We should be good to go now. Okay. Okay, um, one second. Okay. This is uh, weird. So yeah, the, one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, networking and how important that is to the relationships you establish. Uh, just, to, just to bring up a quick point. Um, when I went to Berkeley, there was, just like in high school, where you have the, you know, the typical uh, football player and uh, prom king and, and whatever that everybody looks up to and everybody wants to be friends with, and it's everybody who wants to be friends with them. And it's obvious that they're the cool person. You should associate yourself with them, because if they're cool, then you're, you associate yourself, you're going to be cool. Um, just like that, when I went to Berkeley, there was always those players that were very popular and everybody wants to use and you knew that they're going to be successful, you know? But then there was those, those people that you didn't think, you know, that you didn't think were going were gonna to do anything because they were quiet, they were shy, and you'd be surprised we graduated and then you see this person being very successful, as a matter of fact, way more successful than the person who you would have thought would have actually made it. 
You know, and I found when I graduated, I saw that more often than not, that the most successful people are the people that you actually slept on and the people that you actually almost looked over. And that's when I realized that that's, that's a big talent, uh, 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 seeing something in somebody that nobody else sees. As a matter of fact, you could see something in somebody that they themselves don't see. And that's one of the biggest talents. I mean, if you see the popular player and the, a popular musician, Anybody could say, oh, I want that guy. That's easy because everybody already knows that he's, he's the best. That's easy. How, how tough is it to be able to identify him as exceptional? But it's much tougher to be able to invest in somebody and say, OK, this guy, nobody cares about him. Nobody's calling him. But I know it. One day, this guy is going to turn out to be very successful. So it's very important to not be prejudice about who you want to be friends with because you never know. You might be mean to somebody one day because you think they're never going to amount to anything. And the next day, you're going to walk into a job interview and this person is interviewing. And I'm not just saying this hypothetically. This stuff happens. When you're in the music industry, it's a very small world. If you do somebody wrong, I promise you, tomorrow you're going to run into them and the tables are going to turn. It's not if, it's when. Because if somebody, if you have two people that are spend a lifetime in the business, it's only a matter of time until they run into each other because the business is, the business weaves out the weak and the strong. So if there's two people that survived and are the strong ones, I guarantee you it's a matter of time until they, they, they cross paths. So when I got my first job with Lauren Hill, I got that because I got a call from not the popular person. I got a call from a person who I actually never expected to be successful. Matter of fact, so much so that when they called me, I was in a rehearsal, I ignored their call. I was like, oh, it's not, it's not important. It's just Sheldon. I'll talk to him anytime. I'll call him back. So then I, I went about my day rehearsing and didn't even care. And then I went to the bathroom. I was like, I might as well check my message now. Oh, what is he saying? It's probably nothing important. What? Auditions for Lauren Hill? Oh my God, I got to go. So I always tell this story because I always expected one of the, the people that I was really sucking up to, one of the popular pre people to say, oh, I got an opportunity that will change your life. But I didn't expect it to come from somebody that, that wasn't one of the popular ones. So it's a very important lesson to be able to network and to establish relationships with people no matter how successful you think they're going to be. It's very important for you because it's going to give you the skills that it takes to get along with people. Like when you get hired for a job, not just in the music industry, but in pretty much any job, they, they want to see how good you are at your skill, but they also want to see how, how good you are get along, getting along with people. When you're, when you're on a football team, yes, it's important how you play football, but it's important how you could get along with your teammates and you could be a part of the family and part of the team and how you could cooperate and collaborate with people. So networking and greeting and getting to know each other, something that you guys do now and I'm sure probably take for granted, I think is a very, very important skill no matter what industry you go into. Um, so moving, moving into uh, this world here, Basically, hold on. Let me. Uh, what would happen is, in a studio, when composing. One second. Make this a little slower. Okay, get the guitar. Basically, in a studio setting. It's all about, quote unquote, vibes, right? It's not a professional term, but it is true. It's just like, it's like if, if I, one second, if I go to meet you, right? One second. Hmm. Did you, did you guys hear anything, right? Yeah, is it coming out of that? OK, got it. OK, just like we come in and I have a conversation, right? Um, and, and you say, what do you want to talk about? Man, yo, my mom, I don't know what was her problem last night. She, she made me do my homework after I told her I already did it. Then she said, I have to go to bed early. Oh, man, that's crazy. You know what happened to my mom? And then we'd start going into a little conversation, right? Oh, blah, blah, it's OK. Just like that, with music, you come in and in a room, you've never met somebody before. Hi, how you doing? My name is Jeff. Hi, how you doing? My name is such and such. And you know, you say, okay, what, what, what do you want to make? Well, I made this little drum beat. I made this little drum beat for us to get started to, and it plays this.
I say, oh, okay, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool, okay. You know what, what I have an idea for it. What would what happen if I do this? Okay, he's like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, I didn't, uh, I didn't expect that, but that's that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And then, you know, that's nice. And then uh, to pick up the bass. You got all that. Oh yeah, nice. Thank you. Sorry about that. Hopefully this is in tune. Oh, it's gonna be loud. So then. We really have a little conversation. Oh, okay, yeah, it's just very natural. Oh, that's cool, that's cool. Then in the bass line would go something like this. But I'm just, just for the sake of the record, right? And then somebody say, All right, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh no, oh no, oh no, 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 no. And then here we go, we write a song, and just like that, it's a conversation, you know? And, um, oh, no, that's it. Thank you. And you know, and you, and you start talking like, wow, what does this sound like? Oh man, it sounds like I'm waking up in the morning, you know? It sounds like I'm waking up in the morning and I have to get the day started, but it sounds like there's something about yesterday that's still on my mind. Like, I don't know what it is. Like, I can't almost go about my day without thinking about yesterday. And then you start writing a song, you know? Like, they, just conversations like that. And then a song, oh, sorry. Just, just like that, very, you know, in a very natural and vibey way, a song could be born, you know, and I could start talking about waking up and and going about my day, but yet something, something keeps pulling me back to to yesterday, you know. Um, yeah, it's basically just like conversation like that, you know. And obviously, you keep going and going and adding more instruments and adding more songs, but it's, it's. It's to be able to communicate. All we're doing is just communicating through sound, you know what I mean? So that's, that's basically, in my experience, uh, that's how songwriting happens on a professional level, you know? It's not the only way. Um, it's not the only way. It's, there's plenty other situations where you're not having a dialogue. You're almost having a dialogue by yourself, you know, just how I kind of did that. But it's very important, you know, to look at the uh, comp the, the music industry, just like the film industry, is a collaborative industry. And um, you have to be able to collaborate. You have to be able to network. You have to be able to get along with people. And you have to be able to have a conversation. You can't talk over them. You can't allow them to talk over you. It's a, it's a call and response. You know, It's a give and take uh, situation. So that's, that's, that's basically what happens when you, you, know, when you collaborate on songwriting professionally. Um, uh, any other questions? All right. Okay. Um, you, last, uh, last class, you talked about like, the toolbox, right? And uh, to the chance you can share. Gotcha. Uh, but um, you just added like some, like you, you had like a vocal line at the end of that. Right. Um, and you know, we knew you as a guitar player, but in talking to you and like listening to step this stuff, like you really have like, I'm a really good singer, do a lot of hard work. Can you talk a little bit about how and how you went about doing that? And yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that, the kind of words, Mr. Malloy. But you know, I actually, I actually, uh, actually keep them coming, keep them coming. Yeah. Um, I actually, I, you know, I, I don't look at myself as a good singer, but um, the reason why I started really singing a lot is because um, I, well, for a couple of different reasons. One, because you know, I, I started 
I started be becoming really proficient on the guitar. I started really feeling uh, uh, feeling limited. And is the way word inhibited? Is that the right word? Yeah. I started feeling inhibited by um, by just playing guitar. Um, and I started realizing that, realizing that the, mu the music is a lot more than just my respective instrument. In other words, playing guitar is just one lane in in a, in a racetrack. You know, in that. I'm only responsible for one lane. So no matter how good I get a guitar, I realize that in, in, in the industry, I'm always going to be a one, just somebody occupying that lane. Like, dude, no matter how good you are, just stay in your lane. Right? You heard that word, stay in your lane. And I think it's very important to be able to stay in your lane. That's one of the most valuable skills I have, we have as, as, as employees. But I realized that I'd like to know everything about the, about the other lanes. In other words, to be a good coach, you can't, to be a good coach, or even to be, let's say, in a basketball team, to be a good point guard, you can't just be good at being a point guard. Point guard. You have to know what the center is doing. You have to know what the forward is doing. You have to know what everybody's doing. So in other words, the more I know what you're doing, the more I know what my lane actually is. If I know exactly what you're doing, then I, that's the more I know that, oh, maybe I should stay out of his lane because that's what he's doing. But if I don't know what you're doing, it's very easy that I'm going to come across, I'm going to cross cross lanes because I actually don't know the lane that you're in. So I found it very important to get to know everybody else's position and what they do. Just like in any company, the co president of the company, he just doesn't know what the guy under him is doing. He's doing he knows what the, the PR, the public relations is doing. He knows what, what the janitor is doing. He knows what the CEO is doing. He knows what everybody's doing. And that's how he's able to c run the company. So I realized in the future, if I want to be a visionary, not just a guitar player, but a visionary, I need to know about as much as possible, and the one instrument, you know, I learned about the drums. I learned how to how to program the drums and how to be able to communicate uh, melodic patterns to drummers. Um, I learned about you know what it means to write a bass line. You know that it does. It's not just outlining the chords. It has to it has to be a melody on an independent melody on its own. And one of the last things I realized is that I have to instead of always c trying to work with vocalists and, and, and trusting all all my faith in them, I realized that I should be able to coach vocalists. And through that. Um, through that, I really started to get into learn how to sing myself so that I am able to write for a vocalist. It's really to become a better songwriter that I started to, to write, you know. And, um, and I got to say, uh, you know, it, it's been an amazing skill to have, you know. Um, I've been able to coach some of the world's best singers, you know, um, like Alicia Keys and other people to be able, because I'm able to now know what it's like to sing. I'm better able to coach them and to give them uh, you know, suggestions and improve the whole situation. And in return, it, it uh, brings up the value of what it is I do. In other words, I'm not just a guitar player now. I'm able to be a producer. And in the last class, I spoke about the difference uh, between, the main difference, I believe, between my generation and uh, this generation is that now we all have the same tools. We all have a MacBook. But uh, back then, we didn't all have the same tools, you know. And to be a producer, you weren't just a, somebody who programs a computer. To be a producer, you had to arrange for a string quartet. You had to be able to arrange for a choir, for a horn section, for a rhythm section. And you have to be able to communicate with a vocalist. When the vocalist is not phrasing something right, you're going to have to be able to communicate with them. And what better way to demonstrate to somebody than to actually do it yourself, you know. So um, yeah, I realized I couldn't write songs as good as I wanted to write without being able to actually sing it. So, you know, um, that's, why, that's why I got involved, to just really educate myself around about different sides. It's just like, you know, like, um, like an actor that becomes director, you know, like, uh, you know, Mark Wahlberg didn't start out as a producer, you know, but to, to you know, to adapt. You know, it's, being in this industry, it's, it's, it could become really unpredictable, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm totally having a uh, deja vu. Did I, was it this class or the last class that I talked about the inconsistencies of uh, the, bi the business? Was <laughs> no. No, so, but there's a lot of inconsistencies, as I think I mentioned, about in, in this industry. So you have to really prepare yourself for the climate and, and not feel like a victim, but, uh, but to feel like you're on top of it. And if the climate changes, you have to change with it, you know? So, uh, Therefore, if you, if you think you know about one side of the business, but you don't know something you know, you, about another side of it, you have to, you have to improve that. And they basically say that you improve by working on your weaknesses. In other words, if my right arm is really strong, but my left arm is really weak, what's the point of me keeping having to 
keep working out my right arm. Like, okay, I think my right arm is okay for now, but if I improve my left arm, then I will be well balanced. So that's what it is essentially. If, if you're good at something, keep being good at that. Keep honing in on that, but you have to really uh, uh, pay attention to what your weaknesses are and improve those as well, and that's going to make you a well-rounded uh, individual. Speaking of that, I think there's some uh, students that are nice. chomping at the bit to play with it. Okay. Shall we, shall we do a little playing? Um. You guys just want to jam? Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Oh, nice. Very cool. How would you guys prefer to do? You guys just do you guys want to play a song or do you guys just want to um, do you guys just want to jam? Oh, you, you just want to jam? All right, cool, 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 cool. Um, so yeah, let, um, yeah. Do you guys do you guys know have another song, Sissy Stroke, by any chance? By any chance? Yeah. Okay. Do you know that one by any chance? Okay, it's alright. Um, <laughs> It's C minor. Oh my God. C, C. Guys, yeah, the drummer got some root. <laughs> nice, I like that.
Um, let's do something different. Are you good? You got some signal? Do you want to do the chicken? Do, do, you, do you happen to know the chicken? Okay, sorry. Um, we could just we could just jam, or we could do another one. Uh, is there is there a song maybe particular you want to play, or just want to jam? What's that? Oh yeah 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 yeah. I think I'll remember it. That was really good. Good job, guys. That was awesome, yeah.
song. What do you guys want to play? What's that? I can just jam on whatever. Figure something out. Um, which one? You guys want to do blues? Yeah, we can do a little blues. All right. Um, let's do like a... a Great guys, that was really awesome. Wow. All right. Can we play the chicken? What's that? Yeah. Do you know the chicken? Yeah. Okay. Cool. It's slower.
on one, right? One, two, break it down, two, three. That was good. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's up to you guys. If you guys want have any more questions uh, you want to ask me, um, or if, uh, if you just want to jam, that's, that's fine too. That? I'm trying to think uh, unrehearsed what we can do. Uh, um, which, which ones? Which ones do you guys know? What's, do you, is, is there any? Uh, oh, okay. Um, um, yeah. Oh, really?
Okay, okay. Right, okay. Do we have any time? Is that? Appreciate that. Do you guys want to do higher ground? Yeah.